All right, peace and greetings, YouTubers. So welcome to another edition of In The News. Let me just start out by saying this. You all would not let me live down my little steak that I made in the waffle maker from the last video. I just want you to know that you guys are haters, all of you. So you know what? None of you are invited to my birthday party, all right? It's canceled anyway. <laughs> but no, I'm just kidding. My birthday's not till August. But um, that's funny. Y'all were like, bro, you ain't got a stove? You ain't got an oven? I was like, I do. It's in the back. But that day, I just wanted a grilled steak. And since my George Foreman was at work, I was like, well, listen, I'm going to make this the closest to grilled as possible. So let me pull out the waffle maker. It's okay, though. I understand. Y'all were like, what the heck? Listen, you got to be creative during these times. That's the only way to keep your head on straight, especially with everything going on. You just find ways to make do. I didn't want to take the risk of getting in my car and driving 40 minutes to go pick up a grill, you know, just because I wanted a steak. Plus, I don't even like steak like that anyway. It was just in the freezer. And now that we're all in this kind of stay home phase, I'm in the mode of there's food at the house. And so now I'm just kind of cleaning out what's in the freezer and stuff. And I was like, dang, well, I guess I'll eat that. You know what it reminds me of when we talk about creativity? I always think back to when I was younger, like there weren't a lot of toys in my grandma's house. And so my cousins and I, I remember we used to just take random items. And, and then also like the park wasn't that close. Daffin Park was, wasn't too far from my grandma's house, but we needed my aunt to go with us to walk us because we were too young to go by ourselves. And so we used to take all these different items, like, I don't know, uh, a aspirin bottle, a battery, a sock, uh, what, a quarter, you know, anything, a balled up piece of paper, car keys and we would put it all on top of my grandma's ceiling fan and then turn it on and run for cover and we called that game hurricane and i mean we, we used to go in on hurricane we used to play the mess out of that game and then of course something would get busted because the, the, the ceiling fan starts spinning and then i don't know the keys are too heavy and it flies and, and cracks something that was on the dresser or something now my aunt got to come in and whoop everybody but um yeah you, <laughs> creativity just it just makes life a little bit more entertaining you know what i mean anyway let's jump into some stories so the first thing I did want to touch on for those of you who are really big history buffs or you're into documentaries, there was a great piece that aired on PBS entitled East Lake Metals, A Public Housing Story. Now, I'm not sure when it's going to re-air, but it is PBS, so we know it will come on again, but it just might be at four in the morning. So you might have to either stay up really late to catch it or get up really early or set your DVR or do whatever it is that you do to get your entertainment however you do it. But I would just say check your local listings. It was a really great watch. It goes into detail about the existence of a public housing complex that existed in Atlanta, Georgia. And the reason that I enjoyed watching it was literally because as I'm watching this documentary, the story of East Lake Meadows literally mirrors what you saw in public housing complexes all across the country. Like as I was watching it, I was like, this sounds just like Cabrini Green out of Chicago, or it sounds just like the Marcy houses in Brooklyn. Like literally the story when you talk about the policy behind it and, and some of the movements and everything else that went on surrounding those neighborhoods, those public housing complexes. I was like, this crap is it, it, it's crazy how everything just works full circle. And so. I like the documentary because it goes into detail about the origins of public housing. One of the things that we've seen happen over the last few decades is that the face of those who reside in public housing changed, or it changed, but in addition to it changing, the, the reputation also went through a shift where the people are now vilified. Because when you go into the origins of public housing, it wasn't looked at as something that, oh gosh, it's those people who don't work hard enough begging for handouts again. No, at the time, it was a stepping stone. And the documentary does a great job of addressing that. And also, if you read the book, The Color of Law, it does a great job of addressing that as well. Because when we talk about public housing, and we've talked about it on this channel a few times, but I always, it doesn't hurt to reintroduce certain concepts, you know, the purpose of public housing at the time that it existed was more so it was supposed to be a stepping stone for people to get in, in, into their next phase of life. And so when you get into the 1940s, there's a lumber shortage. And so a lot of white Americans who wanted to go and build single family homes were not in a capacity to do so because the lumber didn't exist. So the government pretty much went out of their way to mandate a bunch of policy to pretty much construct a bunch of temporary housing for all of these tenants and all of these people until the war pretty much would end and there wasn't the lumber shortage and they weren't rationing everything because of course with World War II a lot of things became rationed. You were rationing the food, you were rationing the supplies, a lot of things. Even some of your favorite pairs of jeans you couldn't get at the time because they needed the material to go to the soldiers and so that whole time period was kind of like a big giant pause and so you saw them construct a lot of these public housing complexes that were built pretty decently, you know, two, three story complexes. And, you know, there'd be, I don't know, four or five families living in each building and a few units and so on and so forth. And so that was kind of the thing. And then a lot of those people who wanted to, you know, build their single family homes, they used that as their opportunity to build up their savings as they waited to get the all clear to go ahead and construct. And you fast forward some years, the war ends. All of these people begin to leave and they go and build their single family homes and, and boom, it is what it is. But 
here's a catch that makes it very interesting because then you have to bring in the conversation about redlining. For black Americans, the reason you saw the purpose of something like public housing shift was because as these people were leaving out, because 98% of all subsidized loans that went to people you know, who wanted to purchase homes in, or anything like that, they all went to white Americans. You know, 98% went to white Americans. The other 2% was kind of, you know, scattered between the few black Americans who could get it and all the other races as well. But 98% of all of the loans, uh, the FHA loans, you know, the money that you get to put in that down payment or whatever it is you need to purchase your single, you know, family home, it only went to white Americans. And also with redlining, because there were ordinances in different cities and everything else like that where black people just weren't even allowed to live in certain parts of town and there were only, you know, some portion that you could live in, a lot of times public housing was the only option. Even if you made a lot of money, even if you had a great job or even if, you know, you, you had the resources to go and do what you needed to do with that redlining that existed, you weren't allowed to go anywhere else. So you had to stay in that neighborhood. And even if you had the money to buy this house that you wanted, but it was in a yellow zone or a green zone or blue zone, you couldn't go over there. And so, you know, sometimes even as you were looking for property to purchase or buy, then of course the landlord or whoever was in charge was like, no, I don't want to rent to you. I don't want to sell to you because you're going to bring the property values down. You need to go to that area over there where the rest of y'all be at. And so that's how you started to get such a high concentration of black Americans and Latino Americans living in public housing complexes. And so as you saw the shift of demographics when it came to who was living there, you also saw the shift of investment into the property, which is a conversation that a lot of people up top refuse to have, which is, and I think that gets on my nerves because people who live in public housing are often so vilified, but I'm like, if you're going to vilify the people who live there, can you talk about all of the atrocities that you all up top have done to public housing? Because when you talk about the lack of investment at the time that public housing initially began, you know, lots of investment from the government. And, you know, let's keep let's, the upkeep. We're going to make sure the grass is cut. There's going to be a water fountain. There's going to be a playground. You know, we're going to make sure that the air conditioning is working. If they have air conditioning, the heat's going to be working. You know, we're going to make sure that the electricity is really, really good. And the roof is going to be replaced every five years and this, that and the third. So as soon as this demographic came out once that demographic moved out all of that was cut you know when you see the politicians always saying oh we got we're spending too much in the government we got to cut this we got to cut this got to cut entitlements we got to cut that you know that also means the investment into those neighborhoods also got cut and so you stop seeing you know you stop seeing the landscaping you stop seeing the rules being rebuilt you stop seeing you know the building just going through an overall renovation after a decade or two it all of that went out the window and the buildings become dilapidated and then on top of the fact that the neighborhoods where they exist also there's not a whole lot of anything you know there's not a lot of opportunity there's not you know nobody wants to open their business over there because they're afraid oh it's the black folks over there you know they, they wild and crazy over there we, we're not doing that let's go to the other side of town and so on and so forth and so there's the lack of resources and when you're talking about you know the lack of jobs in the areas and everything else like that and things that are limited there's less money to pull out of the property taxes pool to make sure that the schools are good so then the schools are not super super great one of the things when it comes to real estate is Good schools also mean really great real estate. If the schools aren't great, real estate is going to be trash, so people aren't moving in. And with no good real estate, no new business comes, and so on and so forth. It's like it's all like this really big, just crazy cycle. I didn't mean to go so long into this, but um, we're going to keep going though, because I got more to say. And so you saw literally the demographic shift of who, were, who was staying in public housing all across the country, and you also saw them start pulling funding. But they continued to stuff more people into these neighborhoods and they didn't put investment into the neighborhood. So, of course, what happens? You start seeing the emergence of crime and other things like that. But nobody would address the origins of what led to the crime. They just were like, uh, -uh. It, they just wild and crazy. And then when you talk about them also starting to flood the neighborhoods with drugs and it wasn't. Listen, some of these drugs that were hitting these neighborhoods are not stuff that you find at Cousin Pookie's house. OK, that stuff was flown in and shipped in from somewhere outside of the neighborhood. That's all I'm saying. Uh, but. What also gets interesting is, as you saw the demographic switch, let me reference this book really quick. Um, I think we talked about this book before, but this book High Rises by Austin, oh, Ben Austin, that's his name. And so one of the things you also saw was there was a need for more public housing as you got into the 60s and the 70s. And of course, at this point, white Americans were not really living in public housing anymore. They, at this point, their FHA loans and, you know, dad's money from World War II and the GI Bill and all that, oh, they were living great. So they, they went out to the suburbs because remember, after 1956, they started the interstate freeway system. And so that gave access 
to a lot of Americans to move further. Well, access to a lot of white Americans to move further out from the city because, you know, the city too close to those public housing complexes. It's a little rough over there. Let's move out to the suburbs. So they're moving out to the suburbs. And one of the things that also happens is one, as they build these freeway systems, they build the systems right through a lot of the black neighborhoods. Some public housing complexes and everything get torn down so the freeway can go straight through it. We'll come back to that conversation later on because I need to address Jerome Adams about a few things. But um, the need was there for more public housing. And so Initially, when you're talking about the, the original, you know, properties that existed, it was, you know, the acres and acres of land and, you know, the things were spread out. People had yards, you know, you could run a dog, cut, cut all that. We're not doing that anymore, okay? Too many of them, we're not going to build out, we're going to build up. So this book pretty much goes into detail about, you know, the, them building those giant, you know, 20, 30, 40 story, you know, buildings that you'd see on the opening intro to Good Times. And so let me sit this right here. By the way, by the time we get to the next story, this book's going to magically reappear here. I didn't let y'all know, but I'm a magician as well. Um, <laughs> anyway, and so it goes into detail about just the high rise and building up. And then you saw even less investment because now it was like, all right, we gave you all this. Enjoy. We out. Boom. And so the second half of the documentary kind of goes into detail about what happens when they start tearing down a lot of the housing projects as you get into the mid 90s and the early 2000s and how you saw so many people pretty much get displaced, you know, because that was one of the conversations. That was one of the things that also happened with Cabrini Green as well. As they were tearing down the towers, one of the things that a lot of the residents ran into was that people would not rent to them or let them, you know, move into the properties. A lot of property owners, because there was like 40,000 people just with Cabrini Green alone who were displaced. And a lot of tenants and landlords were like, nope, if you came from Cabrini Green, don't worry about trying to live here. Nope, because we know how y'all are. Y'all gonna come over here and mess up everything. Not doing it. Same thing happened with a lot of the people who lived in East Lake Meadows. And the reason we're talking about this is because at the same time as they were tearing down a lot of the public housing complexes, it shifted more into housing vouchers where the state or the government would give you a housing voucher to help you purchase a home or, or rent or move somewhere else. And so you had landlords and everything saying, no, we don't want you there. Uh, you came from where? Oh, I, I, I thought you said, you know, I thought you said East Point, but you said East Lake Meadows. No, you're not, you, you, you can't come here, sorry. <laughs> Whew, okay, you said you came from Sersum Quarter. Oh, no, that's not going to work. Okay, we're going to have to send you, you know. So that's literally what you saw happen. But the documentary does a great job of humanizing the people who live these experiences as well. Because I think one of the conversations that kind of gets lost in the shuffle is that everybody is still human and people still have lives to live. And when you vilify groups of people who are really doing their best to make what it is or what they have, when you constantly vilify them and make it seem as if any situation that they're in is 100% their fault and you do not even address the origins or the environment or the situations or the lack of what exists within their reality, then it's always, you know, it, it, it's just backwards, which I, I, it makes me just, when I think of the fact that they have like Ben Carson over hood and, and as somebody who's come out of that same environment to be so, you know, pro as far as like, we got to keep cutting funding from them. We're going to cut this and we're going to cut that. And we're going to cut that and cut, 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 cut. I'm just like, hmm. Y'all just, you know, you climb the ladder and just forget who you are. Okay. All right. I can't do it. Speaking of Ben Carson, he still drives me crazy because he talks so slow. I know I talk very fast, but he talks so slow. And I'm like, if you're going to talk that slow, you at least need to put some inflections in your voice or something so you're still entertaining to listen to. Like, can you imagine sitting at his wedding while he was doing the vows? Like, I cherish you. You are my heart. It's been... A great ride thus far. Uh, I, I would have been in that wedding so bored. My God. Um, anyway, but no, so it, it, it's a great watch. So you should definitely check it out. Um, and again, like also, if you get a chance, you should definitely read the book, um, The Color of Law. It's a great way to, because it's literally centered in policy, like literally policy. Um, the author like literally has every ordinance for every city across this country, whether it's Baltimore, whether it's Houston, whether it's East St. Louis, like literally, I'm like, oh, they got the research on this one. So definitely check that out. And again, the doc documentary is East Lake Meadows. So it's a great watch. You should definitely check it out. Voila. See, I told you the book would just reappear. You see, I told you I got all kinds of tricks and stuff. I'm going on tour with my magic show as soon as this mess is over. By the way, I think the lighting might've changed as well because I just opened my blinds. So, the, even the lighting is magical. Boom. Um, happy Founders Day to Spelman College, by the way. And it's April 11th right now as I'm recording. I mean, I don't know when this is going to be uploaded, but just know that when I made this video, it was April 11th. So, you know, if you have to use your imagination and, and push the rewind button, since everybody's days are kind of a blur at the moment anyway, just know I made this on the 11th. So that was the Founders Day. Also, April 11th is significant because it's also the day that the Civil Rights Act of 1968 was passed. 
However, it's interesting that in 2020, you're almost seeing the contrast where you're seeing so many civil liberties of many people kind of be stepped all over due to what's happening. And I think, especially when it comes to the experience for black Americans and even black people globally, you're seeing things that are very disturbing. The saddest bit with all of this that's really bothered me is how you're seeing the difference in treatment and response to people based on how they look or how much they have or where they come from. And so like you saw an example where you've seen so many people who were denied even just getting a test and they ended up passing on or dying because of the conditions with what everything that's happening or people who didn't get the same kind of treatment like literally where the hospitals have to decide who's worth giving treatment to and who's not because there's not enough beds and so like i said before many times and people used to get mad when i said this but i always said that within this country and i think it's also a global thing People can try to push all of the we are the world, you are my brother, I'm your sister conversation all they want. But when something hits the fan and resources get low and lives are at stake, that's when you start seeing this country segregate even more. It's, the country's already segregated by, by, by when it comes to real estate and schools and everything else anyway. Just ask the state of New Jersey. But, you know, when it comes to it just being straight up blatant and unapologetic. Now that's when you're seeing it. You're seeing how the hospitals, unfortunately, are, they're making those decisions. Oh, we can't treat you. You're not worth it. You know, well, we can't give you the test. Like, think about the fact that so many celebrities just were able, or were able to just easily access the test. You know, if you even as a black person, if you have some status and some wealth and you're an entertainer, I mean, they, they just make a phone call and the test was airdropped. Boom, here you go. You know what I mean? And then depending on where you come from, it's a totally different conversation. And so... You're seeing that. You're seeing so many people just like not even be heard and, and becoming ignored. And what makes me concerned is like I, I saw the report coming out of St. Louis where now this report was from the 8th. But like literally every person in St. Louis who had died from the epidemic were all black. And again, some of that also ties into demographics and populations. But it's not even that like you see that there's a blatant disregard for certain lives. And even when you're talking about where to place blame. You're seeing certain groups of people be targeted. So like even with Louisiana, which is currently having this really bad outbreak, you know, the residents are all being vilified, especially people in New Orleans. They're like, it's because y'all went over there and did that Mardi Gras. Y'all don't listen. And it's kind of like, but you know, with Mardi Gras, most of the people who show up to Mardi Gras aren't even from New Orleans. You know what I mean? It's people who travel from all over the country to come there. And so, okay, you know, half the people who came into town already had the mess, went back and spread it all over. And so you have Louisiana, which also has some really crappy leadership as well. And so you're seeing it blow up there. And so it's interesting to see the difference in how the verbiage surrounding Louisiana was treated in comparison to a place like Florida. Um, w when it comes to leadership and what the people were doing, you know, the, the spring breakers who were all getting cussed out, you know, nobody's saying anything about them anymore. It's, it, it's you know, Louisiana, y'all just aren't doing your part, black residents in New Orleans, y'all tripping, it's y'all fault. You know, that's kind of what I'm getting. And then just the disregard for the people in general, like when you look at what happened in Wisconsin with that election, as far as Milwaukee versus Madison, where you have a city like Milwaukee that has about 600,000 residents and they only had five polling stations. In comparison to Madison, which has about 300,000 residents, and they had 66 polling stations. To be honest, I don't think it's a good idea to do any kind of polling anything right now with this election. Nobody should be going in person to vote for anything. If they can't figure out a way for people to do some kind of mail-in ballot or absentee or some kind of way to do it electronically without it being hacked, then I'm like, y'all need to go back to the drawing board. But when you look at the racial demographics of Milwaukee versus Madison, it answers a lot of questions about why you saw discrepancies when it came to the number of polling stations that were accessible. This is just like Ohio in 2004, where you saw that happen. It's just like Miami-Dade County in 2012 during a presidential election. You know exactly what they're doing, and they don't even try to hide it. You know what I mean? It's like they're not, there's no shame with, with some of the things that people are doing. I'm like, are, are you serious? And even when you see, look at it globally um, with France, the, 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 the individuals in France who, you know, they're like, oh, we have a vaccine. Let's go test it on the people over in Africa, you know. And it's like, look, the people in them 54 countries have been through enough. Y'all do that with your own people. You go find some people over there in Paris who are willing to do a trial and you pay them a little money. You let them be the guinea pig. Like, stop dropping everything off on anybody who has any kind of African descent in them. You're seeing it happen over in China where you're seeing the people who are African living in China. They're getting kicked out of the hotels, getting kicked out of their residence, getting, you know, discriminated against. They got to get out of town because people think they're the reason that the disease is even in their country. Like, you're seeing anti-blackness everywhere because, again, anti-blackness is not just limited to the United States. It's global. And so now you're seeing it. And so people are kind of in shock. And I'm just sitting here like, mm, this is just a regular Wednesday, Thursday. You, you, you know, it's what you see all the time. It's the same thing I've been saying on this channel for years. You know what I mean? 
Um, and so again, and it's not a conversation to try to like get people to like, I don't know, want to go and stab up everybody, but it's a conversation to just say, okay, I hope you're being as observant as I am and you're seeing things for what they really are. And you're not being blindsided by a lot of the foolery that's being presented to us as fact and being blindsided by a lot of the foolery that presents to us a reality that doesn't exist. Like, I think there's some conversations to be had when this is all over about how we deal with a lot of things globally, but specifically within the United States, there has to be a conversation about how a lot of things, you know, are dealt with. It, it just makes no sense. Moving on, I want to get to Jerome Adams. God, this video is so heavy. Like, man, I'm trying to like, we ain't got no fun stories. I'm gonna look, after this Jerome Adams one, I have to go back and restructure what I want to talk about because we can't be mad the whole video, all right? We're gonna have to do another live video too. We're gonna have to do another a quarantine party or something again. Anyway, then we have Jerome Adams. Uh, David Clark Jr., where do we start? And so pretty much, you know, he's been given the press briefings with the White House and everything like that. And these come on literally every day. Now I have stopped watching them for the sake of my sanity because I'm just sorry, there's too many stupid people up top trying to tell everybody else what to do and they're not even on the same page. So it's like, you know what, nope, don't eat. I can't do it because they're literally like, misleading the people on Monday and then they change the narrative on Tuesday and then Wednesday it's this and then the president starts talking about the ratings and everything else and he wants to open up on Easter and you know because remember two months ago it was oh this would be over with and, you know it, it's just gonna like magic just disappear you know it's at 15 right now it should probably go down about five in a day or two and it disappear I don't have time but anyway so Jerome he's going on this whole bit and somehow they get on the subject of just you know the amount of people who are passing away so he gets on his you know soapbox and he's talking about you know to the black and the latino communities how we have to step it up and you know we got to stop drinking and we got to stop doing drugs and we need to call our mamas she wants to hear from us you know um you know and we need to stay in the house we need to think of big mama and, and abuela and all of that and so i'm sitting here watching this now a lot of people are like y'all are always overreacting da, 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 da. it's not even that deep i'm like no it, the thing is this you know i find it so funny that you've watched an administration drop the ball and not only drop the ball, it's like, I don't know if the ball was a wrecking ball, but it landed and it landed in, in like, on like a glass floor and went through the floor and went further down and went through some more levels. And then it went through the earth's crust into the upper mantle and it, it's, it went to the core. That's how far they dropped the ball with all of this. And so what's the next thing you do? Find some folks to blame. Blame it on those people. Because of course, I had a friend that made a really good quote and she has this blog. It's called um, Whispers of a Womanist or Whispers of Womanism. It's a really great blog, but she made this really great quote where she was talking about when it comes to the black experience, whenever something bad happens to black people as a collective, the narrative is, oh, they brought it among themselves. It's all their fault. You know, they, they, they just don't ever learn. But whenever black people accomplish something, then everybody else tries to run in and say, oh, well, they didn't do it without our help. If it wasn't for us, we would have got you to where you needed to go. It's kind of like when Stevie Wonder was talking about police brutality and then a lot of white people got pissed off and said, after all we've done for you. And I'm like, excuse me, this boy can, well, not boy, excuse me, but I, well, he was a boy at the time. He can play the piano blind. You know, he's 12 years old and he's created this massive catalog of just genius music over, you know, five, six decades. You didn't do anything. You listened. You know what I mean? But uh, like, well, after all we've done for you, there's almost like this conversation of ownership of any time black people accomplish something. It's because they let us have it. Like, that's literally the conversation. So as I was watching Jerome say all this foolishness, I'm like, why are you coming after black folks and even the Latino community, especially when you brought up the conversation of drugs? Out of nowhere, all of a sudden, the big opioid epidemic disappeared overnight. For all the people popping pills and coke and everything else that they do, it, never mind all that, it's the black folks with that marijuana. Yeah, it's them. Yes, that's, that's what's happening. And I'm like, you know, it, if you're going to have the conversation about telling people to not do drugs, okay, well, tell that to everybody. Y'all want to be all lives matter any other day. Now you want to focus on black folks today. Black lives matter. Y'all need to stop doing drugs. Okay, but tell that to everybody because it's no secret. I know that the president is doing some lines of coke. Gotta be. He's up there sniffling every five minutes. Every time he's doing a speech or if he has to read that teleprompter, Today in America, we two very big words. I'm like, what? Is, what? Uh, and then start sweating and everything. Like, what is going? What's, uh, uh, uh. <laughs> what is going on here? And so it's like, if you're gonna have the conversation about alcohol and drugs, then you need to address everybody. It's not just only two demographics in the country doing that. That's everybody right now for those who do it. Plus, you got everybody in self-isolation and quarantine. People are miserable. You got people who I feel bad for. You have some folks who can't leave the house and unfortunately they're in abusive relationships and everything else. One of the things that I think got lost in the conversation with all of this is the mental health of people. 
for some people, they need to be around others. Humans were already social beings. So the fact that all of us or most of us have kind of been to ourselves or been in our homes and, and even people who may not be married or have kids or have families, like it's a mental toll on people to be in the house all day. And every time you turn on the news, there's some bad news. So there's going to be some people who need to start drinking. But the funniest bit that I see is, again, to only target one demographic of people talking about step it up. I'm like, well, what do you think the rest of the country's doing? Every time I look on the blogs or something, you can go on Pinterest right now. It's a bunch of white women telling you how to make sangria. So you can't sit here and try to point out one group of people. Like, it's like they just put it all on us. Like, yep, you black folks again, they over there drinking fifths. Y'all need to stop drinking them fifths in that mad dog 2020. It's the problem. That's why all of y'all dying, because you drink. And so he starts bringing up all of the health concerns and the diabetes and the heart disease and the hypertension and the asthma. He even pulls out his inhaler about how he's been using this for 40 years and then he's about to start crying. And I'm kind of like, all of what you just mentioned is the end result of a larger conversation that we've been having for years. When you talk about the structural atrocities that happen to different groups of people, if you want to talk about hypertension, heart disease, diabetes, then can we be honest? Like, why is it that in the city of D.C. war they'd only had one grocery store for years? A ward full of tens of thousands of people only had one grocery store. What happens when there's only one grocery store in the neighborhood? Everybody has to use it. There's a limitation with what's accessible. The produce is not as great because there's not as much investment going into that grocery store. And literally, the only reason Ward 8 now has two grocery stores is because white people moved in. So they said, ah, here's, here's a Whole Foods. I'm talking about DC, by the way. Like, literally. So you have to talk about the conversation of food deserts that exist in populations where there's a high density of black Americans living in certain spaces. You have to talk about the food deserts, the lack of quality food. You got to talk about the fact that you find a higher percentage of fast food locations in areas where there's higher populations of black and Latino residents. Like, you have to talk about that. If you're even talking about asthma, can we talk about air quality? But before we get to air quality, one of the leading triggers that lead into asthma is you also have a low birth rate with babies. And a lot of times that happens in neighborhoods that may not be as affluent. It goes back to lack of resources, lack of opportunity. That's one of the triggers for asthma. Now, research has shown, and they're trying to claim that living next to the freeways and everything have no correlation with asthma. I still don't believe that because there's absolutely no way when you're just talking about the amount of toxins that are in the air in some populations in comparison to other areas. But when you talk about the, the introduction of the freeway, and again, you had the freeways built directly through a bunch of black neighborhoods and the portions that did not get torn down by, you know, them extending the freeways are still there. And so imagine the experience of people who've been living next to car exhaust every single day with thousands of cars for years upon years upon years upon years upon years. All the toxins that are in the air. And on top of the fact that a lot of times, depending on where a lot of black people live, especially during the industrial industry, when you're talking about all the factories and because we have a current administration that has eased up on all of the regulations when it comes to air exhaust and, and, and just, you know, the, the emissions, how they're just cutting, they're cutting all of that. Well, we don't need that. We don't need that. We need, we need these companies to make some money. So, no, you can, you can release as much carbon dioxide and carbon monoxide and as many toxins as you want. Go ahead and release all that. You know, if you want to talk about asthma and stuff, well, you need to be honest about how all of the policies and all the decisions play a role in how, into how it affects the people. You can't sit here and, and endorse a, a cabinet or be a part of a cabinet that continues to just, and not just that cabinet, because literally a lot of the previous cabinets have done a lot of terrible things as well. But, you know, all of that structural policy, all of that implementation, you know, all, all, all of that, I was going to say activism, that is not the word I'm looking for. <laughs> you know what I mean? All of that activity that has been done by the, these administrations that have directly affected pockets and populations of people who may not be as wealthy as others. You can't sit here and vilify them because, oh, well, y'all had y'all got hypertension, y'all got diabetes, you got that. You need to explain why and what led to it. You also need to recognize the fact that living in America is a mentally draining experience for people who are not white. I talked about the research that came from, I forgot where it came from, but it talked about even people who immigrate here from the central, like even Mexico, Mexicans. After living in Mexico and coming to the United States and being in the United States for more than 13 years, their health is actually worse than it was before they got over here. Same thing when you talk about black people when it comes to health. When you talk about like Martin Luther King, the fact that he had the heart of about an 80 year old when he died. He was in his 30s, but his insides were so just worn down and beat up. That comes from the stress and the mental trauma of having to walk around with black skin every day. And so when you're talking about all of the diseases that affect black people as a collective, you got to get to the origins. You just can't go up there talking about because Cousin Pook and them got, got, you know, they drinking a little bit of Mad Dog on the side. That's the reason everybody's dead. You can say, you know, you can, you can bring it up if you want to, but listen, we have to go back and look at the origins of everything that's been happening for the last 50, 60 years. Like, how dare you? That's the issue I have with a lot of people because you want to celebrate people as they, they climb, 
But then what happens is they're so pressed to assimilate. And the other thing is like, you can need to recognize when you're being used as a mouthpiece for white supremacy. So, you know, the same thing for him, uh, Diamond and Silk, uh, Candace, Oak, like all of them. I'm like, y'all, mm, 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 mm. The real conversation is, listen, at the end of the day, the police will still be called on all of them if they're driving too slow in the wrong neighborhood. But let them keep thinking that they, they are part of the elite chosen or something. I don't have time. I can't do it. Um, but Jerome, I, I, I just found it interesting. And then again, if you're going to bring up, you know, well, we need to step it up. Well, then I need the whole government to step it up. Even when I saw the clip of that police officer in Baltimore purposely walking in that black neighborhood and then coughing, <coughs> like on purpose, like... I don't even have to worry. It's just, that's all I can do. And then you want to go up there and do this whole speech. I'm like, okay, you know what? I'm, mm, 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 mm. Mm. Talking about call my mama. You know how much I call my mama a week? I get on her nerves calling her so much. My mama don't even live here. I got to call her like twice a day. She'd be sick of me calling. She Sometimes she send me to ignore her. I'd be like, dang, okay. She got a new boyfriend now. So she, she she's, you know, she's in her Stella got a groove back mode. It, you know, after, after you lose a parent and they start dating again, you know, they, they get the rebirth. So she's enjoying her rebirth. She ain't got time for me no more. So again, I was just like, Jerome, you, come on, man. Come on, man. Jeez, like, I, mm, 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 hey, what a joke. Speaking of drinking. Did you all see the story about that mayor in Illinois where, you know, he ordered the police to go and raid this party that was taking place? Because, of course, there's the social distancing laws and everybody's supposed to kind of be separate and not gathered in groups and the clubs and bars are supposed to be shut down. So the police go and they raid this place and then his own wife is at the party in there getting down, having her a good time. I said, you know what? See, Jerome Adams, this is why your message needs to be universal. Don't just be pointing out certain groups of people when the leadership all across the country, their own families ain't even following instructions. I was like, I know he was pissed off. I'm sure the police like kicked the door in and they were in there dancing to Sweet Caroline or something. <laughs> like, that's embarrassing. Hot mess. And then did we see this clip of the police in Philly pretty much dragging this guy off the bus because he didn't have a mask? Because now you're seeing a lot of the companies and everything and the stores and transit saying if you're going to ride or you're going to come shop here, you have to wear a mask. It's almost like we're revisiting the other story I talked about from the Washington Post. And so I guess he didn't have a mask. And so by the time it gets to the end all be all, you have like a handful of police officers dragging this man off the bus. I just personally think it would make more sense if maybe the police would show up with a mask to give the man instead of dragging him off the bus because I don't think I saw gloves on the police officers. So if the man was already infected, well, now y'all got it too. And you're going to take it home to your wives and your kids. Like, you know, or, or maybe, I don't know, there should definitely be like a stack of masks or something at the front of the bus that people can get. I don't know how you can get it without infecting them, all of them, but figure it out. You know what I mean? Like, we're such a violent state where... Um, well, not we, but, we, you know, we live here. But, I mean, it's such a violent state that we live in. It's like every time you turn around, they'd be ready to shoot you about something or drag you and stump your head in. I'm like, kind of nonsense. Again, it's, it, it, you're seeing so much, so much foolishness. So it's like literally a headache to follow. And then I also read the report where there was an 891% spike in calls to mental support phone lines. And so, again, I think with everything that's happening... It's so important to make sure like you check on your friends and family and colleagues and people that you value because you just never know what people are going through behind closed doors. Again, what we're experiencing is something that most of us have never seen in our lifetime. And so being in a position where you don't even really know what's next and you're just living day to day. And if you do watch the news, there's never anything good that comes on because there's just so much craziness that's happening. And then depending on what your experience is with your finances or if you've lost your job or if your job is in jeopardy, or if you're furloughed or whatever it is, like a lot of people are dealing with a lot. And then the fact that, you know, there's been 20,000 people to die so far just in the United States. And, you know, a lot of people haven't even been able to go and properly bury their relatives because they weren't allowed to, you know, have a full funeral or even... When the resident died, they weren't even allowed to go to the hospital because there's a limitation with how far people can get to the property. Like there's a lot that's going on with a lot of people. So really just make sure you take the time and check in with people and make sure that you're good. Like if it's too much to watch the news, don't watch it. Do something that can help you have a little bit of peace of mind. Find something that will keep you like you got to have some kind of sanity. Like even if you just need to stand on the front porch for, for five minutes and breathe some, some of the air. I was like, real talk. The other day I, I was looking, just watching the birds. <laughs> I was looking at the birds in the trees. I was like, you know what? They just get to fly and be all free. They get to go wherever they want. They get to do what they want to do. 
here we are all up in this apartment just stuck up in here what kind of nonsense <laughs> you know um but it just, just absolutely crazy um last thing because i did say for those who watched my live i was going to start reviewing a few books um i'm going to add two books to the review i know one is tanahisi coates the water dancer um but like i said i got um i had the tony braxton book i didn't like i got it once it was on audible it's actually been an interesting read so i'm gonna add that one to it it's tony braxton unbreak my heart it's also on audible if you just want to listen to it and then um the other one i'm thinking of um james baldwin and it's the first next time and that one's also on audible if you would like to get it so i'll definitely address those hopefully throughout the next few lives i know for the next live i'm definitely starting with tanahisi coates and then maybe we'll get into tony and james baldwin in the later ones and so there's that and then also i have something kind of cool to share with you guys on monday you'll just see it when i upload it hopefully you guys don't tear me down for it but you know we'll get there well we'll get to it you know what i mean anyway i'm out subscribe your mind's craving for the things that really matter But the world and out of time, the cloud, the sense is got a mouse on the hurdles goes and break the glass Spread into a field of years to come and rise and grass Hats all the gyms and missing puzzle pieces Now it's trial and error as you find the links to rolls and reason Take a break for yourself You're not gonna miss your season when it rains You water falls into the roots of all your trees So just listen It's life Doesn't always make sense But the most important thing You're still here And that, ladies and gentlemen the hardcover.